This is Twit. Uh, where to start? Where to start? Uh, let's start because actually this kind of reminds me of um, artists. Uh, hopefully. Uh, making sure that they get a cut of whatever deal Taylor Swift cut with Universal, um, making sure that you're looking out for your own interests. Uh, there is uh, a guy named Tony Schmidt who has sleep apnea, who definitely um, is good at looking after his own interests. He has a CPAP machine and he figured out uh, after his first night of usage of the machine, he got a message, I believe it was an email from the device manufacturer praising him on you know, how great he slept and how well he used his machine and that he'd earned some kind of badge. <laughs> and he began to realize that the machine was phoning home, not just to his doctor, but to his health insurer, to the device manufacturer itself. Uh, and um, he was not real happy about this. So he filed complaints with the Better Business Bureau and the federal government. Uh, there's really nothing happening with those complaints, but at least he's made the issue public. And people who use CPAP machines know that this is this is a problem. And I think it's a greater problem, um, not just for this particular medical device, but for medical devices going forward. Uh, they, this, like many of them, is an expensive thing that a health insurance carrier might cover, that a patient might need the health insurance carrier to cover if they're going to use it. And in this particular instance, um, this machine, you know, if your sleep apnea is bad enough, this thing can save your life. Uh, but if you can't afford to have it, then uh, you might need your carrier to cover it. And if the carrier is going to cover it, they might demand that it give the carrier, all kinds of information about the way you're using the machine, um, your various health details that it can glean as you use it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, not a real super pop positive story here because, I mean, it's good that we're having the conversation, but I really don't see this problem going away. And I do see more and more people saying, hey, well, you know, I need the machine. So I guess not only my doctor gets this information, but so do all these other third parties too. Uh, what do you think about this, Steve? Well, it's it's a big issue. Um, you know, it's uh, we now have the capacity to, to generate all this data uh, from all these places. And we also have the capacity not just to, to collect it, but to, to monitor it and to analyze it and to use um, artificial intelligence programs to, 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 to figure out what to do with it. And the insurance industry is, is going to be right at the heart of this. Um, you know, and, and it's not just medical devices. Uh, there was an article not too long ago about um, uh, a, a electric toothbrush, which would basically uh, collect data from how many times you brushed your teeth. Um, and it's not hard to, far, very far-fetched to say, okay, well, what if your health insurance carrier, your dental carrier were to say, all right, um, Denise, um, we're looking at the records here and you didn't, you didn't brush your teeth every day next week, last week. And uh, so we're going to, to increase your premium um, mm -hmm. by some amount. And, you know, this is already uh, being contemplated by insurance carriers in the automobile industry. Um, and I wrote a post about this not too long ago. But the, the notion is that data from your automobile uh, can be con collected and transmitted. And insurance carriers, your automobile carrier, can look at the data and make real-time premium decisions. Um, based on what it found, how fast you go, uh, what part of town you're going to, uh, all those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of demonstrates what, where we are with privacy in a lot of ways because um, we all give up privacy every day uh, all over the place. Um, and this is just another example. I mean, the, the man with the sleep apnea machine, he could decline to use uh, the machine because he does not want that data transmitted. So what's his option? 
uh, get another machine that sends it to somebody else? Um, what if your insurance carrier came to you and said, you can get a 10% discount uh, on your on your insurance premium provided that you let us collect and monitor your data? Uh, most people, I think, would say, well, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, take take 10% off. I'm a good driver. Um, and so do, do we really want that kind of intrusion into our lives? Do we really want our carriers, insurance carriers, looking at those things constantly and making those kinds of, of decisions um, about our insurance? It, and it's, so it's a real thorny problem. And it, it, it's compounded by the fact that we don't often don't think about ownership of data in a very realistic way. Um, you know, we have anytime you get an app uh, or, or new software, you have this very lengthy consent form that most of us don't read and we just agree to. Well, the, the reason they have those forms is is so you can give away your data, right? I mean, it's, it's at, at core, it's your data, but we often just, just give it away for, for nothing uh, for the convenience of using whatever device that we want to use. And, you know, at some point, you have to say, well, what is a con- what's the concept of privacy mean um, where we have all just basically given it away without thinking? Uh, and this is a prime example of that. I mean, I think we're going to see more and more uses of the data by insurance carriers uh, to make uh, decisions about premiums, uh, to make decisions about insurability, uh, to make all sorts of decisions that will affect us in a very real way. Do we want that as a society? I don't know. It's a tough question. Yeah, it is. And I think I think it's something that uh, regulators are going to have to start paying attention to and, and looking at as far as balancing those concerns of privacy and the interests of the insurance industry. What do you think, Stefan? I find it pretty disturbing how how many of these issues boil down to the logic of if you've done nothing wrong, you have nothing to hide. It's a very insidious way to think uh, about Mm -hmm. life in general. And I think most people, given a very modest incentive uh, financially, for example, uh, will do things that have downstream effects that are pretty dystopian. And they can always rationalize it by saying, well, I'm behaving properly and in exchange, I'm getting a, a little bit of a financial benefit. So this is a rational thing for me to do. And it's outside the scope of my concern to deliberate about um, the cumulative effect of all these decisions and how they might impact people who aren't me. And I think it's that is the default mode that people operate in. I, I, I believe that they just sort of look out for themselves and they respond to very basic incentives. Um, it's hard to convince people to think beyond that. And I don't even know that we've begun the conversation of how we might do that. So I, I really do see you know, the status quo right now being some kind of a dystopian future where we're all constantly being surveyed and our uh, technology sort of moves from being this thing that we use as a convenience to something that kind of controls us. And the only way to avoid that would be to have a truly uh, insightful uh, regulatory framework that accounts for people's inability to think beyond themselves. And I just don't see any kind of movement in that direction. I mean, you've got people who in academic circles or in sort of uh, nonprofit circles are making the arguments but to then take those arguments and scale them up to where they compete with the kind of reasoning that I, I laid out at the outset, you know, the if you're not doing anything wrong, then you've got nothing to hide. You kind of need a similar aphorism to help people say, <laughs> you know, in that same intuitive way, combat this idea. Because otherwise, in 10 years from now, I, I think many of our kind of routines will be very closely monitored and will impact um, sort of ranking in society, uh, so to speak, and, and will kind of impact our credit scores or insurance premiums, uh, our ability to get employed. And a lot of that will be dictated algorithmically. And you know, it's up to us to stop it if we don't want it. And I just don't see any kind of signs that we're doing that right now. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking about uh, David Egger's book, The Circle Game, which uh, was turned into a movie, which I thought, by the way, was a horrible movie. But I thought the book was actually pretty good. But mm-hmm. you know, you, it, it, when you read the book, you you sort of start off and say, well, that makes sense. Yeah, I can say that makes sense. And then you go down this road till you say, well, wait a minute, that, that doesn't make sense. And I think <laughs> that's kind of the, the argument here. Um, I did an interview not too long ago with a, a woman who's general counsel for a company that is trying to 
uh, create a recognition among people that their health data, first of all, they own their health data. It's their data. And two, it's worth something. It has a value. Uh, and it particularly has a value to Big Pharma because while Big Pharma gets a lot of data, it's not very robust because they don't have um, – they're not supposed to have the kind of uh, identifiable – personally identifiable information that would make it more pertinent. So they're they're trying to create via the blockchain an ability for people to better control that data and make decisions about it, whether they want to sell it uh, to, 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 to pharmaceutical companies, whether they want to keep it, what they want to do. And um, so, you know, I, that I think is a noble effort. Like Stefan, I'm not, I'm not sure how far that's going to go because we, we seem to so uh, – Willy nilly, um, uh, just just give everything away, and don't even think that it's our data. A lot of times, uh, I mean, I, right. I, as I was reading through the notes for this show, I was thinking about it, and it it sort of hit me that, you know, I own this stuff. Uh, you know, it's mm-hmm. my stuff. I've, the fact that I give it away doesn't mean I I didn't own it at one time. It is my stuff, um, and people, you know, sort of forget that. Um, and, you know, query whether the courts are going to recognize the value of, of kind of privacy and data uh, in the judicial arena, uh, whether the government's going to get involved. Uh, you know, it's, it's a sticky wicket all the way around. But I think I think Stefan is exactly right. Unless there's a better yeah. recognition of privacy and maybe uh, you know a new a new view of what privacy really means in today's society, we're headed to a point where you know as many people say we already are, privacy is dead, meaningless. It's a meaningless meaningless concept, and I don't think that's what we want. I mean, there are things that that uh, I think we would all agree need to be kept forever private. Um, and we may not be able to stop them from becoming public. Yeah, and I would just encourage folks uh, to take the example from Tony Schmidt, this CPAP user here to, you know, if you see something weird going on or data going somewhere where it shouldn't, not to roll over on that, but to to make a stink about it. Uh, my own healthcare insurer asked us as it's processing a claim for uh, some treatment my son had, it asked for a copy of the detailed doctor's report um, in assessing whether or not the claim would be covered. And it already had all the codes that it needed, you know, all those things that say what treatments were given, et cetera. So I really felt like it had what it needed. I went ahead and sent them the report they asked for, but I wrapped it in all kinds of, uh, and not everyone can do this, but I just, you know, whatever you can do to make them think about it, I think is important. I wrapped it in all kinds of legalese about what they could do with the report when they had it, who could see it, uh, that it had to be destroyed uh, after a review, that it couldn't be stored, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that completely brought the claim to a dead halt because I haven't heard from them <laughs> since. I think that uh, their legal department is still scratching their head about, well, gee, can we use this report or not? But, you know, I, I think that it pays to send a message to um, the folks that are asking for your data, as Steve points out, um, who who – might not be entitled to it if you don't give it to them, that that, that ma- data and its privacy matters to you um, and to, to emphasize that as much as you can. Uh, well, well, here's, and on, here's yeah, sort ahead. of the, the flip side of that too. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. um, you know, as you were, you were talking about the healthcare issue, I don't know if you've ever been a, in a position where you have to get health, your health records that are in one hospital chain to a doctor in a hospital that are in another hospital system but it's a royal pain in the you know what uh and it you know you, as you're going through it you think they're right, well, why, you can't just access them and look at them so the doctor can give me the correct care i've got to fill out a form send the form file it with the appropriate regulators wait you know two weeks uh that's assuming that they're going to comply with the regulations and they're not so it's another two weeks then you literally have to go over to the office and you know stand there till they hand them to you so you've got all this inconvenience that uh, you have to suffer from somewhat because of bureaucracy but somewhat because of the recognition of the privacy associated with health records so when you when you start hitting people with that you know their reaction is well 
no, just give it to them so I can get on with my life, right? <laughs> so, right. So that's the dilemma that we we have with a lot of these privacy issues, and it's it's what Stefan was referring to is you, you, you frequently you make these decisions based on convenience, and you don't ever think, well, you know, that's going to have some repercussions down the road. Uh, do I really want them? And you know, the the uh, the article that. Uh, Ellie Mistal wrote about the sky think brings that out. I mean, he he has elected, um, and he's the one of the editors at Above the Law, who's I think we can all safely agree is fairly outspoken. Uh, but he's elected not to use elect um, because he fears the collection of data. Uh, maybe fear is the wrong word. He's concerned about it and doesn't want that right. intrusion in his life. And that's that's great. I mean, he has made the informed decision to do that. Um, yeah. I've made the informed decision to have one. You know, it's sitting here looking at me right now, probably listening to every right. word that I've said. Uh, but I made that election for convenience. So that's great for people like me, for people like Ellie, for, for people like uh, Denise and Stefan. But there's so many people out there that I, I think they don't go through that thought process. They just say, oh, I, I want that new gadget. I'm, I'm getting it. And I don't care what happens to my stuff. I don't care if Amazon now listens to what I am doing and is going to give me ads about all sorts of stuff that you know, I may have commented on um, not, not very long ago. So that, that's the, the kind of the part that is a little bit of a disconnect is it's the informed consent piece. Um, I don't think as a legal system we've really focused a whole lot on that. What does that mean um, uh, in the context of the of new technology and the digital age? Uh, what what do we have to say? What do we have to show uh, t- to to say that we have given the customer or the purchaser the, the opportunity to make an informed decision uh, about yeah. their data privacy rights? 